and and about a exciting SARE grant that we're working on. So take it away, buddy. Great. Can you hear me fine? Sounds great. Okay, cool. Um, great. Well, thanks for having me, Steve, and thanks for talking about oyster cultivation. And um, yeah, it brings me back to the days of chopping straw and packing buckets and um, yeah, the like experimentation and learning how to grow mushrooms. Um, so that's a nice, nice, uh, nice way to start out and just like get experience with growing. Um, so my, my name's Willie and I have a business called Fungi Ally, which I started back in 2012 or 2013, somewhere around there. Um, and today I'm going to talk some about um, the evolution of, of this business um, and kind of my evolution as a uh, mushroom cultivator, um, you know, from the very beginning to the middle to um, now, what's, what's going on now. Um, and then, yeah, talk to someone about this SARE grant that um, we're current, Steve and Steve and I primarily are currently um, facilitating and there's gonna be a lot of uh, workshops and online webinars and other opportunities uh, this winter. So um, that's our path that we're gonna meander down um, for the next 45 minutes or so. Um, so like a lot of other growers that I've, I've heard stories from, um, I kind of started out uh, growing mushrooms on logs. Um, so you can see this top left picture is some nice shiitakes fruiting off of logs. And then I evolved into straw uh, uh, cultivation, oysters on straw. And finally ended up at supplemented sawdust blocks. Um, so it was it was a evolution in terms of uh, like cost of production, um, uh, efficiency, and uh, time. Um, so when I first started out, it was on logs, and I remember um, just like a hot day with uh, this guy I'd met, Bill Cooley, um, getting logs out from a, a forestry operation so you know a lot of forestry operations just leave the tops of the trees um, where they cut them so we we found one and um, he's like yeah you can take the logs um, for free if you just go out and cut them and so um, what we didn't account for is the time like cutting them and then dragging them to this uh, this forest road and driving them out and um, that was hot, sweaty work. I was like, in my, just in my boxers, carrying these arm loads of, you know, uh, 20 pound logs uh, to the car. And pretty quickly uh, in, that, in that first year, I think we inoculated something like 400 logs and pretty quickly realized if this was going to be a full-time business, there's gotta be a wet, better way of doing it. So after inoculation, you know, there's this one year, uh, 18 month, uh, period where nothing's happening, um, which is really what drew me to mushroom cultivation in the beginning was I was on a vegetable farm and um, was like, there's, there's must be a better way to grow food other than this like daily weeding and harvesting and maintaining and plowing. Um, and so that's, that's how I kind of was like, Oh, mushrooms are cool. And no one's really doing them around me. And they could be a great addition to the local food movement. Um, but in that 18 month, or 12 month uh, time span of waiting for the logs to um, uh, colonize and be ready to fruit, which at the time I thought, and kind of still think every time I inoculate logs is totally crazy. I'm, kind of, I'm like, what am I, what am I doing here? Like the, just like uh, plunging, you know, plunging my psyllium into this log and waxing it. It always feels absolutely crazy um, until the day that the mushrooms start pinning out. You know, that's where it's like, oh my God, this actually works? Like, incredible. Um, so grateful for that. You know, I just had that experience a week ago on, on uh, in, uh, uh, soaking some logs that were fruiting for the first time and just that feeling walking up, you know, six days later and being like, oh, it worked. Oh my God, there's mushrooms. Um, so during that time span, that gap of waiting, the incubation period, 
Um, I went and did a couple of courses out on the West Coast, one with uh, Jay Schindler um, in Washington, uh, which was a week long course just on, you know, how to grow mushrooms and was my introduction beyond a book, um, you know, after reading Mycelium Running and growing, growing gourmet mushrooms. Um, my first introduction in person to, you know, sterile culture and uh, inoculating straw and all those sort of things. And uh, after that, in um, uh, January, I went to Aloha Medicinals and um, uh, they're the largest quote unquote medicinal mushroom um, producer in the world. And so I went there and uh, again, learned a lot about lab skills and uh, how to grow mushrooms basically. And came back and um, built the first uh, uh, grow room. Um, so this is me, uh, me with uh, my my business partner Dylan Kessler. I'm on the left uh, with uh, back when I had some locks, and Dylan's on the right with a nice uh, flush of of oysters that we had picked off of uh, straw. And when I got back from Aloha Medicinals, uh, we built our first grow room. So basically. Um, thinking how could I make this, uh, you know, being something like 24 or 25, uh, there's such a, for me, there's such a um, uh, focus on uh, bigger, like bigger, better, faster, more. Um, so how could I make mushroom production a year round thing that could um, allow me to buy a farm, you know, allow me to uh, have a, have a business that I could buy land and, have a relationship with land and do it in a way of connecting people with food. Um, so here is the humble beginnings of that. This is a basement um, in a in a big house, um, and we just cleared out an area and put down. Um, you know, we we ripped two by fours in half because we didn't want to spend um, two dollars on a two by four. We only wanted to spend one dollar. So we ripped them in half and put up this basic frame and just stapled uh, plastic to the inside. Um, there's humidifiers and fans in there. And um, this was our first setup for growing indoors. And um, I had just graduated from UMass as well as uh, Dylan. We had both just graduated from UMass Amherst. Um, so we had access to a laboratory there. Um, so they had an autoclave and a flow hood. So we would go and um, we would uh, make the sawdust blocks at my house and then go to the university and autoclave them and then bring them back to my house for incubation. And then when they were complete, we'd bring them to this fourth location for uh, fruiting. So we were driving all over the place and, um, and it was basically all uh, – um, just in basements. So whatever basement we could find, we were filling up with mushroom blocks and getting fruiting rooms in there. Um, our first uh, harvest and sales were to a uh, local co-op called All Things Local. Um, this is Dylan, me, and Bill, um, who are the original starters of Fungi Ally. And oddly enough, um, king oysters were our first crop that we harvested and, and sold. Um, and I say it's it's odd because I I have a really hard time growing king oysters now. They're very um, finicky mushroom to grow. And I think part of it is it was around March when they were fruiting, so they like it cold. And um, yeah, but that was our first first uh, sale to a co-op and operating out of that um, those four different locations and fruiting in that one room. Um, and in 2000, so that was through 2014. In 2015, uh, we received the uh, SARE grant that Steve mentioned earlier, looking at oyster cultivation. And um, we built a second grow room uh, for, for the purpose of looking at that and just having more space, um, which was at a fifth location. So we continued to uh, spread ourselves out all over Amherst and Hadley. Uh, the towns that we lived in. Um, so as you can imagine with all these different locations, a lot of our time was spent carrying things and loading them up and down stairs and loading them into cars and just uh, moving all the time. So definitely our, um, 
our beginnings and, and the beginnings of Fungi Ally were based on inefficiencies and just the will and, uh, and finding places where it could work. Um, so trying to spend as little money as possible and grow as much mushrooms as possible. Um, so this is in a, in a tobacco barn. And again, uh, we splurged for this one and kept the two by fours intact. Um, so we, we just did a two by four frame and then plastic on the inside staple. Um, and this is where we were fruiting um, the oyster mushrooms through 2015 um, and um, conducted that grant. So the, the temperatures sometimes, I'd say in July, they got pretty hot. It got up to like 85, 90 degrees in this grow room. Um, but otherwise, in uh, April, May, June, uh, most September, October, conditions think about not a whole lot. You know, you can you can get away with very basic uh, to start with, um, especially if you're just operating on like a fifty pounds per week or like a, a local level. Um, then that's a, that's a, that's, you don't need a splurge for something crazy. Um, and around this time in 2015, we started purchasing ready to fruit blocks in from other companies. So realizing our, uh, five location, um, juggling wasn't very efficient. Uh, we learned about, uh, other companies that were making the blocks and just selling the blocks. So, um, through 2015 and so 2016, um, we were buying these blocks in from other companies um, and just focusing on fruiting and sales. Um, so this was the 2015, 2016, our business didn't make any money, um, but it did allow us to continue growing and focus on uh, other aspects of, of the business, you know, like uh, trying to find a single location where we can grow all these mushrooms. Um, and a ready to fruit block is essentially, um, uh, supplemented sawdust that has been sterilized and inoculated and shows up, uh, ready to fruit, right? Um, so since when we were doing that in 2015 and 16, there's probably five or six additional companies that are doing it and it's, it's becoming more commonplace. So, um, I think it's a little bit more accessible now. Uh, than, than when we were uh, working on this. Um, and then in 2015, um, we, the end of 2015, we signed a, finally signed a lease to move into a warehouse. So this was our warehouse that we uh, started renting. Um, it was a 3,000 square foot warehouse. And as you can see, has uh, a bunch of loading docks. So our vision was to um, kind of use the 3,000 square feet in the uh, warehouse and then expand out into uh, tractor trailers. Um, so those could just be backed right up to the um, warehouse and um, um, mushrooms cultivated in, in them, either as incubation or fruiting rooms. Um, so a big part of this growth um, going from these five different locations to uh, one consolidated spot um, was funded through <coughs> grants and other um, uh, like fundraising um, mainly the infrastructure was mainly through a uh, mega and, and a Kickstarter campaign we ran so mega is a, uh, a Massachusetts specific uh, grant called the matching enterprise uh, I'm not sure what the rest stands for, um, but it's a it's for beginning farmers years one to five to uh, be able to spend some money on infrastructure, uh, and then we also ran a Kickstarter, uh, and so between the two of these, we raised twenty thousand dollars to make a, a fruiting room and make a lab and really start to um, uh, produce our own blocks in house. So. Basically, we identified that most of the money we, we were spending growing mushrooms was going to buying blocks in. So if we could bring that 
whole aspect of the business uh, in-house, then we would um, be able to make some money. So, um, and then, and then uh, during this time, I was also teaching workshops and doing this research education uh, or these research projects through SARE, which allowed me to have some um, income uh, because at this point the, there wasn't much from the um, business. Um, and so this is kind of, this is a little snapshot of the lab that we built. Um, we use pressure cookers uh, for our grain spawn and and uh, cultures. Uh, so uh, uh, you know those are much much more likely to become contaminated. So the rest so the method that we're using for our bulk substrates wouldn't really work for those. So uh, we use two 75x pressure cookers. Um, and both of those can fit six bags each of grain spawn. So in a day, we could uh, easily make 12 bags of grain spawn, um, which was enough for, for our operation. Um, and then on this picture over here on the left, we have a, a flow hood. Um, so we had two flow hoods that were each about uh, five feet long um, and sealers and all the things necessary to uh, uh, make a lab run. Um, and we used a uh, washable material called Coroplast in the lab um, in, for, the, uh, for the like exterior walls. And Coroplast is a material that's uh, very easy to clean. Um, and uh, it's not a natural material, so it won't get like molds and other, uh, other type of things growing on it and then getting into the, um, into the bags. Um, so at this point in 2016, this is what we used for our uh, sterilization. So in the uh, stock tanks that uh, we, we um, autoclaved in, so these are the stock tanks here, um, we could fit about 200 bags. So um, the bags were uh, a mixture of uh, sawdust and soybean hulls or sawdust and wheat bran. Um, and then packed into the uh, 300 gallon stock tanks. And then this uh, hose right here, this is a nine kilowatt uh, sauna steamer. Um, they're relatively cheap. I mean, it's maybe $200 to $300 to buy one of these units. Um, and this brand, the Nature brand, has a setting for continuous heat. So it, it can just be turned on and left on for 24 hours. Um, so we would, we would run our steam for 24 hours into these uh, stock tanks and then take them off and, and push them into the lab to cool. And we would allow them to cool for 24 hours and then inoculate the next day. So on Mondays, uh, Monday we would mix a batch and pack 200 bags, put it in the um, stock tank steam all the way until Tuesday, and then push that um, trough in on Tuesday to cool until Wednesday, and inoculate on Wednesday. Um, eventually, we uh, wanted to be doing more than 200 blocks a week, or more than 400, so we added in a second stock tank. Um, so on days when uh, the bags were just cooling in the lab, we could be using a second stock tank to um, uh, be filling and steaming. So um, by the by, about 2017, we were doing a thousand bags a week. Um, so uh, that's quite a lot, and we filled up the our you know 3,000 square foot uh, warehouse. Um, and uh, in 2018, bought uh, five tractor trailers to attach to the 3,000 square foot warehouse. So. We hooked up the tractor trailers uh, to the warehouse, uh, which allowed us to have much more incubation space and fruiting space. Um, and what's interesting is these other aspects of the business really started growing along with fresh mushrooms. Um, so in, in 2018, last year, we were doing about three to 500 pounds of fresh mushrooms per week. Um, we were doing, uh, in 2017, we started an online business selling spawn and, and uh, mushroom kits. 
And uh, last year we were doing about 60,000 in online sales, those kits. Um, and then still doing workshops and teaching and uh, uh, working on several grants. Um, so in that time, I received four or five different grants um, that were completed. And in 2018, received uh, a couple more through both uh, uh, the Massachusetts Department of Agriculture and SARE. Um, and, and so in, um, and during like the 2016 to 2018 time, both Bill and Dylan left Fungi Ally, um, kind of going on to other projects and other things in their lives. Um, so there is a lot of transition and um, a lot of time spent growing fresh mushrooms with, um, with relatively uh, minimal yields. And so um, in 2018, I started to analyze a little bit more how I wanted to be spending my time and what the best way um, to kind of serve the mission of uh, this business that I started was. And um, the mission continues, continues to be connecting people uh, through the world of fungi. So connecting people to themselves, to the community, to food uh, through fungi. And um, what I came to is that maybe growing fresh mushrooms or growing 500 pounds of those fresh mushrooms a week isn't the best way of doing that. Um, maybe the best way of doing that is selling grow kits and just educating people. Or maybe the best way is, is really just doing uh, 30 pounds of log production a week and uh, selling at, a, at one farmer's market. So um, in 2018, I decided to scale back the um, fresh mushroom production. Um, and, um, and so I sold that aspect of the business to another mushroom farm here in uh, Massachusetts called Mike Oterra, um, who have an amazing operation. Um, I, I got the, um, uh, the um, privilege of touring their facility and taking a, um, a video of it and uh, just posted through our uh, YouTube channel. Um, two videos touring their facility and it's a really beautiful facility a huge autoclave and nice lab and they're growing maybe 1200 pounds of mushrooms per week now um so a a um getting to a, a large-scale farm you know um i mean there's i'd say large-scale farms are the farms that are growing maybe 20,000 pounds or more um but uh in terms of small-scale farms that are big um, they they Mike Oterra is up there. Um, so sold off that aspect of the business in September and have really been focusing on, uh, education and, um, online sales, uh, since then. Um, and I, w one thing I will say in terms of, um, uh, uh, fresh mushroom production is um, the evolution of, of customers for me was very interesting um, starting out with uh, farmers markets and a lot of connection to um, the consumer and then thinking that it needed to be bigger and more and um, and if and if I produce more mushrooms that'll mean it's a more successful business or That'll mean it'll I'll be making more money or something, and so slowly uh, shifting to uh, wholesale focused, and and over time the the much different feeling that this uh, that those two methods of uh, sales provide. Um, so by 2018 we we're um, doing one farmers market, but pretty much exclusively wholesale, and it's a very different relationship than at farmers markets and. I think I'm at a point now where um, just selling at farmers markets um, or through CSAs would make way more sense for, for what I'm trying to do in terms of growing food um, and the relationships that I'm trying to cultivate when I am growing food. Um, be, just because of part of, uh, I, I found the part of the difficulty in uh, wholesale production is uh, the focus on efficiency and uh, speed and price. Um, 
Whereas at a farmer's market, that seems much less important. And really the important pieces are the connection and uh, the location and the um, uh, uh, quality of the food. Um, so I, th so yeah, I, I think I would like a piece of advice, I guess that I'm, I'm, I'm feeling is for people that are at the, uh, 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 farmer's market CSA scale, um, to really optimize there and not feel the pressure or, um, uh, like false promise that if you go bigger and produce more, things will be better. Um, but if you can figure out a way to be at uh, the farmer's market scale or be selling to local farms, um, then that can, be, that can be really nice. It can be really, really nice and uh, provide uh, good, meaningful uh, food production. Um, okay, so in 2019, um, moving away from uh, a focus on production, um, on, on fresh mushroom production, um, this year has really been a year of education and uh, online uh, spawn sales, so spawn and grow kits. And um, that continues to grow for us. And um, it's really fun to make all these different little booklets. And um, for the first time this year, I'm putting on a mushroom festival, which is a dream that I've had since like 2014 to hold a um, event and a time and a space to really put the mushrooms in the center and um, just have all these people gather that are excited about mushrooms. So um, if you're interested, that's gonna be in Deerfield, Massachusetts uh, in two weeks, September 14th. Um, you can check out more on fungiali.com or through Facebook or something. Um, but it's been great to have the time uh, to organize that sort of thing. Um, and then we've put out two other uh, cultivation-based booklets, uh, cordyceps and shiitake, and a uh, consumer-based uh, education booklet uh, that's called Beyond the Button, and is kind of profiles of four or five different mushroom species, uh, what medicinal mushrooms are, and some different recipes. So really just trying to get more people eating mushrooms, interacting with mushrooms, having a relationship with mushrooms. Um, and it, and it feels good to have that be the focus rather than uh, just increasing production of mushrooms. Um, and that is important to some uh, aspects and in some ways, um, but I, I, uh, isn't the only thing. And for me, I think I got lost for a couple of years in focusing exclusively on that. So it's been really nice to step back a little bit and recalibrate um, why it is that, um, why does fungi alley exist and why am I doing this work, uh, with mushrooms? Um, so yeah, that's what's going on in, um, my, my world and in my journey of, uh, of, of cultivating mushrooms and producing mushrooms and having relationship with mushrooms and encouraging other people to have relationships with mushrooms. Um, and I will say that this year, with the uh, not growing mushrooms, I feel a big uh, gap, I feel a big gap. Um, and I am, I am, there's like a lot of mushrooms in my life. I am growing them and, and just giving them away to neighbors and stuff. But um, there's something about that uh, daily or weekly rhythm of tending to the mushrooms and, and watching them and being in a relationship with them that is, is um, really missing uh, for me. And so, Moving forward, I'm really excited to incorporate mushrooms into a uh, homestead or community level farm um, where they're not the exclusive focus, but they're part of this um, uh, uh, greater picture of what a farm and food production can be. Um, so that's, that's kind of where uh, mushroom farming and, and my relationship with mushrooms is, is headed um, as we move into 2020 and, and beyond um, because mushrooms are a really critical um uh like keystone player in uh how food is produced and how uh organic matter continues to move in the world um so um yeah i'm excited to take all this information from commercial mushroom production 
um, and apply it into uh, a, a different focus in, in what mushrooms are and how they can uh, be in my life. Um, and another huge part of what I am doing right now <laughs> is uh, a SER research and education grant. Um, so uh, Sarah told me that I'm the first farmer in 20 years to get a uh, research and education grant. Um, usually it's uh, primarily uh, institutions and universities and stuff. So um, that's, that's a pretty, pretty exciting that they um, saw the, the benefit that mushrooms potentially have to offer and the opportunities that mushrooms um, can bring to farmers and communities. Uh, to to fund this project, um, and the focus is increasing the specialty mushroom industry in the Northeast. So, um, again, going beyond the button, moving past just uh, agaric and spice forest um, into mushrooms like shiitake and oyster and lion's mane and piopino and chestnut and maitake and um, you know all these really delicious mushrooms that bring variety and meaning into the uh, purpose of being a mushroom farmer. Um, so we, Steve and I, are looking at how to increase that that uh, specialty mushroom industry. And it is extremely small. I think it's something like 7% of the total mushroom sales in the United States. Um, but interestingly, in the last five years, um, shiitake has become the most cultivated mushroom in the world. Uh, and for a long time, it was uh, um, it was agaricus by spores that was the most commonly cultivated. But now shiitakes are on top, and I think uh, rightfully so. They are so so yummy. Um, and what has me really excited about the specialty mushroom industry right now is that there's a lot of um, information that's being shared online of. Uh, how to kind of bootleg a farm. And it doesn't have to be this huge uh, uh, $100,000 investment to start growing specialty mushrooms. It's really something that you can put together in a 20 by 20 shed and easily be growing 100 pounds of mushrooms a week. Um, so my hope is that more and more uh, farmers of you know diversified vegetable farmers and just people looking to connect more with their food will look to uh, specialty mushrooms and, um, and, and begin to grow them. Um, so there's some different uh, levels or like parts to this uh, grant. Um, the first one is a series of cultivation guides that Steve and I are writing. Um, so these uh, will be published right around the beginning of November. Um, and the first one's an introduction to the specialty mushroom industry. Um, so just talking about what it is, how to become part of it, um, why it's important, you know, those, those sorts of fun things. And also, where did it come from? You know, I've been, I've been wondering a lot about where the specialty mushroom industry in the United States came from. Because up through basically the 60s, 70s, you couldn't really find any mushroom beyond uh, buttons in a grocery store. Um, and, and shiitake spawn was like illegal to have in the United States or to import until the 1980s. Um, so where did this industry come from and pop up from? And um, my theory is that it, it really came from uh, the, the psilocybin uh, interest that, that popped up in the late 1950s. Right, so um, from Gordon Wasson going and ex and experiencing philosophy and and what it has to offer and sharing that with the world, and then all these uh, hippies, you know, going to mushrooms and then learning, oh, there's these amazing edible mushrooms um, that we can grow and eat too. Um, so wondering more about where this this industry started, um, and then the second one is methods of commercial cultivation, and we're um, we're primarily looking at three methods. Um, one is the uh, uh, oysters on straw, as Steve was uh, outlining earlier in this uh, webinar. The second is uh, supplemented sawdust indoors. Um, so 
um, you know, either producing your own blocks or buying blocks in, in and fruiting them indoors, and then supplemented sawdust outdoors. Um, one of the farmers that I started to uh, work with in 2017 was Elizabeth Almeida, and she um, she uh, was a mush is a mushroom farmer, and her, her farm is called Fat Moon. Um, she's a mushroom farmer in uh, Westford, and for two years her whole operation was just a walking cooler and uh low tunnels outdoors um and then she started to have a grow room in her garage as well but simply using low tunnels outdoors in the woods um is enough for fruiting a lot of different specialty mushrooms so um, the third method is uh supplemented sawdust outdoors um and then the last guide will be fruiting and selling with grower profiles uh, so we'll kind of uh, outline some different farms that are, that are growing mushrooms and doing it in different cool ways um, and uh, talk about how to fruit and sell mushrooms as well. And we'll have some videos accompanying this. So we'll, we'll do some video tours of the mushroom farms and really get a sense of uh, how, they're, how they're rocking and rolling. Um, so part three won't completely be done until, uh, you know, next year um but the others will be publishing um in uh november um and it also in november we'll start having some in-person workshops so we're going to be doing 10 workshops uh throughout the northeast um maine new york city delaware west virginia baltimore um all over the place um to kind of promote the grant and start teaching about these different methods of cultivation um, so those, if you, if you want more information, you can check out, uh, uh my website, fungiality.com, um, or Cornell for information on, on those. And we're going to be publishing the workshop schedule and locations, um, probably by mid to late September. Um, and then finally, um, or nope, not finally, just the next step in this grant is a online webinar series. Uh, in February. So that'll be completely open to the public. Anyone can join and it'll be a three week series um, on commercial mushroom farming, um, how to do it, how to do it uh, profitably. Um, and the idea is that we want to support growers that are interested in, in growing mushrooms to know how to start um, depending on, on what they're trying to get out of it, what the resources they have are, um, how much time they want to spend kind of uh, put these these metrics in place so that people know where to start so that you don't have to be like me and do uh, shiitakes on logs and oysters on straw and then ready for blocks and then block production and kind of just figure out all these different ways of growing and then say, oh, this isn't the one and move on. But to really have a good guide of, okay, if this is what you're wanting and this is the amount of time you're wanting to, to, to spend and... Uh, this is the amount of money you want to spend, um, then here's a good uh, method for you to look into. Um, so the online webinar series will be going into some of that. And then in 2020, uh, we'll be supporting 10 different farmers uh, growing 30 plus pounds of mushrooms per week um, uh, throughout the year. So that's from like May until October or so, um, using any one of those three methods of cultivation. Um, so We'll be there for supporting either uh, making improvements to the farm or setting up the farm. Um, and then in return, uh, growers will uh, keep some data on labor and costs and um, pounds produced and sold and that sort of thing. Um, and so this will give us some, some live data on those different uh, methods of cultivation. You know, what, they, uh, what exactly they uh, cost to um, begin and what they what you can get out of them what's the um, uh, you know yields or uh, prices you can get you can get from them um, so that's going to be the kind of uh, arc of this grant and um, yeah I'm super excited to uh, work with some farmers uh, throughout the growing season uh, to really dial in uh, these different methods of cultivation and and hopefully get more people uh, growing mushrooms and fruiting mushrooms and buying and eating mushrooms. Um, 
So if you have if you have uh, questions on that uh, grant or want more information, um, you can email me uh, at uh, Willie at fungialley.com or just go on our website and and check out uh, the the link. Um, so yeah, thanks for listening to to my story and who I am, and um, hope I I get to meet you and share your your passion of uh, growing mushrooms and eating mushrooms and being a mushroom. <laughs>